Hey there, Commanders. So to get things started, I put together a basic build that requires no engineering and without engineering gets you just shy of 40 light years max jump range. Though your typical jump range is going to be you know, somewhere down here in the 30, in the mid 30s, which is not bad. Mid 30s gets you about 90% of the places you want to go in the galaxy. It does make it difficult to go somewhere like Beagle Point. For that, you will want to do engineering. Uh, but jumping around the bubble, jumping around most of the mid-rim, and anywhere in the core, uh, this is fine. The only real uh, hit to performance you're going to take here is in travel time. But when you're exploring, travel time isn't always as important as people have let on. And there is diminishing returns to your jump range. Uh, meaning that higher jump ranges get you better travel times up to a point, and then you flatten out on a curve, and it starts making less of a difference. This might change in the future as game technology improves, uh, but for now, um, the best you can possibly get with engineering on a, a key outfit chip is about 80 light years. Uh, the Diamondback, and the Diamondback can actually get you most of the way there. Uh, so, basic rules for setting up an Explorer. Uh, you want lightweight alloy, uh, and you don't want derated power plants. Derated power plants have a little hitch right here that, that absolutely screws you. You'll note here this 2A has a 0.4 efficiency. If I go over here and I select the smallest derated power plant, um, that my jump range doesn't go up that much, and I actually increase my weight. See, a 2A power plant is smaller and lighter than the next size up 3D. And if I were to actually stick a 2D on here, which you'll note that uh, in our, or sorry, Coriolis is telling me that I can't do this because it doesn't produce enough power, um, there's ways you can cheat this and, and make that work, but you're arguing over a third of a ton, which doesn't really do much for jump range. But for demonstration purposes, let me turn off all of this other stuff and show you that we went from, with a 2A, we had 39.47. With a 2D, uh, we get 39.51. So if you wanted to min-max, sure, you could you could stick a, a lighter weight reactor on here, but you'll note the 0.75 efficiency, which is a terrible number. And, and I mean incredibly terrible. This keeps you from fuel scooping effectively. Uh, it means you have to keep flying away from the star to cool down. Your ship runs much hotter in all environments that it will operate in and becomes much more sensitive to thermal attack. It doesn't produce anywhere near the power of an A-rated reactor. So when you're building exploration ships, you want to make sure that you're sticking the smallest A-rated reactor on the platform that you can fit, even if it's a little bit heavier. Uh, and you'll want to make sure when you're specking it out for engineering that you're paying attention to your efficiency, because this number is shockingly important. You wouldn't think it's important on exploration ships, but it matters a whole lot, especially on the Diamondback. Because of the way the optionals are, are formatted, you don't really get the luxury of um, scooping quickly. Other ships in the game are better at refueling, the Diamondback isn't. It's one of the costs of buying something cheap. Don't confuse cheap for bad, because the Diamondback is one of the top performers in jump range, and that is a figure that explorers do care a lot about. It does make traveling easier. Uh, four D-rated thrusters. Now, there is a misnomer in this game that D-rated thrusters keep you from exploring high G worlds. This is false. One of the little cheats FDEV has put in here is that thruster output scales with gravity regardless of what it says here in the output uh, statistics. You have enough thrust to get away from any planet that the game will let you land on. Um, I don't necessarily think that should be the case. I think it would add survival mechanics and dynamics to the game to have it not work like that, but that is how it works. Um, D-rated thrusters do hamper your maneuverability in high G worlds. So if you know you're going to hit up a 9G planet, it's still a good idea to put A-rateds on, but on small ships, it's really dealer's choice in that one. I recommend D-rated thrusters because they consume less power and have less module mass. Uh, now, A-rated frameshift drives are super important. If there is one thing you splurge on, it is this drive. It should be a no-brainer for anyone building a ship like this. The biggest possible A-rated frameshift drive you can fit every time, all the time. Life support. Uh, this is one of those dealer's choice situations because engineering does let you come back in here later and fix things up, but typically explorers run D-rated life support because they're not planning on getting in combat or going places that are going to blow the canopy out. 
Um, two tons is actually not a big ask for module weight in this category, but you can also still go in and lightweight the crap out of this baby to get it down to under one ton. Uh, 3D power distributor. This is, um, Coriolis tells you uh, what your ship can handle by highlighting uh, stuff that is too underpowered in red. However, the game will let you put any power distributor you want in here. So if you were really feeling like min-maxing, you could put a 1D on this thing. What you would lose is your boost. Um, so you're sacrificing normal space performance for, uh, for jump range, effectively. But you're also still talking about fractions of a light year. So for convenience purposes, I typically recommend players stick the smallest D-rated power distributor that they can on here. Uh, and if they have engineering, or if you do have engineering, I'll just demonstrate this really quickly, you can go in here and engine focus a 2D power distributor to get some boost capability back. But that's not a catch-all that gets you out of every situation because you'll note if I try to do that on a 1D. Oh no, actually the 1D does work too. Um, I thought it wouldn't, but apparently it does. Uh, so you can actually boost with a 1D power distributor if you grade 5 engine focus. 3D sensors. D-rated sensors are important because sensors can weigh a lot. What I don't recommend, shrinking your fuel tank. Fuel tank is the heaviest thing on this ship, and a 32-ton fuel tank really helps the Diamondback Explorer because your fuel scoop sucks. And having a bigger fuel tank means you don't have to scoop as often. But when you do scoop, it's going to be for several minutes. And that's kind of the catch with this ship build. Um, let me turn all this stuff back. Now, even with a 2A reactor, you do have to power manage by turning off modules that you aren't using, things like your planetary vehicle hanger, the mining laser, uh, and the AFM, which is one of the big power draw sources. Fuel scoops are a big deal for explorers. Uh, 4A fuel scoop, if you've got the budget, is what you're going to need. Coriolis tells you your refuel time based on tonnage. Uh, this is a minute and a half to fill a 32-ton tank. Kind of a negative, but this thing can do eight or nine jumps if you're good with your fuel budgeting before you have to stop and scoop again, making it a prolific neutron jumper. You can travel a lot of distance and not a lot of time with a setup like this, but if you're on a budget, a B-rated fuel scoop only costs you an extra 10 or so seconds. You know, about 15, actually. Uh, and the same thing with AFMs. B-rated is actually better in this case, not for durability, but for ammo. You'll note that a 4A AFM has 5400 ammo while a 4B AFM has 5900 ammo. This makes the 4B a little bit more synthesis efficient, which matters on long voyages, but it also draws less power and costs less money than the 4A, making it easier for commanders on a tight budget. Shield generators. It is possible as an explorer to operate without shields. I've done it. I've flown an anaconda from here to Beagle Point during Distant Worlds 2 with no shield generator installed. You can get away with that, but it puts an incredible amount of emphasis on your ability to fly because mistakes are semi-permanent. Unless you've got a repair Olympic controller, you have to live with any hole damage you take. Now, I happened to have a repair Olympic controller on that expedition, and I had to use it a couple of times to make up the difference. You need to be a really good pilot before you think about going exploring without shields because you'll bank days, weeks, hell, if you're really committed, you could bank months or even years of exploration data and it'd be a real cry and shame if you forgot what you were doing for a couple of minutes and rammed into the surface of a planet. Shield generators give you a lot of forgiveness in those terms. Even a meager 83 megajoules is better than nothing, and it lets you land very efficiently, because when you don't have shields, if you hit the ground going faster than 5 meters per second, you will take all damage. Uh, now, other module considerations. I have a couple of these bays blank because I wanted to emphasize that you don't have to fill everything, and sometimes a build for core exploration will actually require that you not in order to hit jump targets. When you have empty slots like this, you can just stick cargo racks in them and get some cargo space back. It does not affect your jump range until you actually stick something in there. So it's basically free space. And all explorers should have a planetary vehicle hangar. It kind of completes the package, even if it's just a small one. Um, there are some niche builds that don't have uh, PVHs so that you can get a little bit better jump range. But again, we're talking about minor differences and planetary vehicle hangers just don't, they aren't that big of a deal, especially these one base. Your two size one modules down here in the bottom 
uh, you should have a detailed surface scanner. You need one in order to get mapping values for planets. I don't know if Odyssey is going to add any more considerations for the size ones, but your other size one module ought to be, or should be, a very important little guy down here. Super Cruise Assist. When exploring, you will occasionally come across a binary and even sometimes trinary star systems where you have multiple bodies that are extreme distances from one another. Super Cruise Assist is a convenience function that lets you lock onto something that's two or three hundred thousand light seconds away and accurately navigate to it without actually needing to be sitting in your chair. Which helps when your Super Cruise flight time is going to be 30, 40, 50 minutes. You can go take a dump, do some chores, run a batch of laundry, watch TV. Whatever suits your fancy, while your ship literally flies itself to the destination, you just set your watch and come back when it's done. The level of convenience Super Cruise Assist provides is an incredibly valuable tool for explorers, and you should have one of these on board. Even if you have it off when you're not using it, just have it with you. It's so nice to be able to set and forget and just go do something and come back in 20 or 30 minutes when your ship's arrived at a destination, provided that destination's worth the 20 or 30 minute time sacrifice. Finding your ship, neatly orbiting a planet without having to worry about surface smashy smashy is just awesome. Because nothing ruins an exploration voyage more than explosion sad face. Hard points. Um, I have a mining laser in here because occasionally uh, you can arrive in what are called green systems. These are no official technical designation, they're actually a community designation in the Elite Dangerous Star Map database. Green systems are systems with planetary rings or surface sites from which you can scrape all of the raw materials necessary to make FSD injections. I'll save the mechanics behind FSD injections for another video, but effectively you can spend engineering materials to get a one-time jump range boost. A useful tool for fringe exploration, especially on the outer ring of the galaxy, typically used in conjunction with anacondas and crates, the Diamondback can also take advantage of this, but as this is an introductory build, I don't want to dive all the way down into the, the nitty-gritty. If you're in a ship like this without engineering, FSD injections are not something you want to be dependent on, uh, and I would emphasize that a ship build like this is going to be for exploring the main parts of the galaxy, not trying to star hop on the fringes, just um, stick to the, the cores with this, and then come back in as you build this ship up later, and you can vastly improve its performance. Um, but you could also stick a mining laser or a beam laser, or pulse laser in here for other purposes. The main reason to have this though is mining materials and then you might throw a beam laser or I even actually think the mining lasers can also trigger uh, guardian sites. And the Diamondback Explorer is very good at hitting up guardian space and for a cheap ship that can hit that it's that's actually ideal. Uh, now I actually don't know why I don't have uh, point defenses are important for Guardian surface sites. We'll call this an all-arounder, um, but you should put at least one point defense in any exploration ship that you build so that you can go to Guardian sites and you can scrape Guardian materials from them. On the Diamondback Explorer, you want to put this point defense right on its forehead on that utility slot directly above the cockpit, and when you land at a Guardian site, land so that the cockpit faces into the site. If you happen to get fired on by a Guardian Sentinel, your point defense will shoot its rockets down for you without even needing to be on board. It's a great way to eliminate a very obnoxious attack pattern that the enemy has at those sites. Heat sink launchers. Um, you actually don't need all that many. It just depends on how much synthesizing you want to do. Um, run whatever you feel like, but um, just keep in mind that, that they do have mass and they do affect your jump range. And just making the little changes that we have so far, we've already got our unengineered jump range north of 40 light years. So, um, one heat sink launcher, if you engineer it, I recommend nano capacity for synthesis efficiency, but that does take us down below 40. Um, you could also lightweight this. Um, if you've done any basic engineering collection, you probably don't have to worry about it too much. You'll usually have enough to restock this, but um, when we get in and do some more detailed engineering later, you can get this thing set up so that you don't even need the one heat sink launcher on there, you just have it for redundancy. Um, but for early level, I'd, I'd maybe slap two in here and uh, get used to how the ship performs, how it manages heat, um, and just uh, lose the 40 light years for the time being. 
and then you just uh, go down here and if you're over spec you turn the extra ones you don't need off and just cycle through them. This is easy to put together you could probably have this build up and running in an hour maybe hour and a half and, and start getting introduced to the mechanics behind exploration. Uh, and uh, over the next couple of weeks I'm probably going to do a more detailed dive on these types of builds get them set up show you how all the engineering works and uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, but that's all I've got for today so I'll, I'll catch you guys later.